Well, I have been blessed immensely already. We could have a benediction and go home revived. And I really appreciate that good music. And uh, I just don't understand why it takes an insurance company two years to figure out it wasn't your fault that a truck hit your house. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, man, that's, uh, that is interesting. The, uh, I can't wait to tell people that I was in revival where Tom T. Hall provided the music. <laughs> Gonna, it's going to give a lot of credence to it. I mean, they're really going to enjoy that. Uh, but I just can't tell you how blessed. That's the music that uh, I grew up on, that kind of thing. My father loved music. Uh, Greg was a musician, self-taught, and loved the Carter family. And that song, Will the Circle Be Unbroken, A.P. Carter wrote that. Um, and we have it because of him. Um, it, very interested in your... Uh, music instrument there. <clears throat> you know who invented the first music instrument? It's in the Bible. It's in Genesis chapter 4. His name was Jubal. And Jubal has, was the father of all who played the flute and the harp. And that's the first uh, uh, mention, I think, in the Bible of, of music instruments. So uh, we know that music comes from the very heart of God and, and I just can't tell you how much it adds to um, worship and, and to the message. I tell everybody that the, the greatest sermon that I ever heard, the sermon that had the greatest impact on my life, had no words in it. It was my father sitting and he worked two shifts, two, uh, two jobs to uh, provide for his six children and his wife. Didn't have a lot of free time. Um, and in our house, there was an old pump organ, old, one of those old pump organs, you're familiar with those. And, and for his time of, uh, to bring peace of mind and, and uh, his time of quiet time, even though the organ was in the room where, where the TV was, so I, he never thought I was listening to him, he thought I was just watching TV, but I would listen to him play. And that's where I first heard the old songs, a lot of the old Carter songs and things, but he would play a song called, There is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. And I can still see him sitting playing that. And that song had the biggest impact on my life of any sermon that I ever heard. And still today it's a great spiritual marker in my life. So music is a, is a great part of, of my faith. I had a little thing I used to keep on my desk. It said, music touches places in the soul that words alone cannot. So I thank you all again for sharing with us and for blessing us. And, and I have, I was very familiar with that old Lester Flat song. I could sing it with you. Uh, yes, sir. -y. That's a good song. And you're right. It doesn't get much play. And a lot of people have never heard that song before. Well, I'm glad y'all are back. Glad you came back tonight to hear the second part of, a, of the sermon about revival. And um, we want to get into that tonight because it does pick up where we left off last night. So I want to take us to the Lord in prayer and then we're going to continue on with the sermon. And Father, we just want to thank you for the blessings of today. And Lord, we realize that every day that you give us on this earth is a gift from you. And Lord, how we live our life and... Lord, what we focus on in that day is our gift back to you. And I pray, Lord, that you have been pleased with our life today. And tonight as we come before you and look into your word, I know, the Lord, that we will be challenged by your word because it always accomplishes its purpose. And so, Lord, tonight I just pray that your spirit would move in and out our hearts and open our eyes to the spiritual truths that come from your word that we might make them become reality in our life. I thank you for everyone who's here tonight, and I especially thank you, Lord, for the music that we just heard. And we pray all these things, Lord, in your holy name, the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, last night we began by just talking about what revival really is. I made the statement last night, you know, if you aim at nothing, you hit it every time. But also, if you aim at the wrong thing, and you hit it, you still have missed it. And so we want to make sure that we are understanding that what revival is all about, it is changing us, it's adjusting us to God. And we can't stay where we are 
and go with God at the same time. Every time God speaks to us, it requires an adjustment of our life to Him. So that we are seeking revival, which means we're going to have to find out where God is speaking and what God is saying and adjust ourselves to it. That's what revival really is all about. Revival is a time when God comes and bears witness against His people. It's when God comes and speaks to us and points out the, the areas in our life that we need to change and adjust to Him. We talked last night about uh, the fact that there's really only two, only two paths that, that we can be on in this life. It's either on the path of revival, which is moving us toward God, or we're going to be on the path of judgment when, God, when we're moving away from God. And God must judge that. He's holy and righteous and He must deal with sin. He does that because he loves us. And we concluded last night with, the, with a challenge by what Jesus said uh, to us of how he measures our love for him. You know, the great com commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. And then we concluded, according to John 14, 21, when, when Jesus looks at our life to, to measure our love for him, what does he look at? Well, according to John 14, 21, he said, He that has my word and obeys it is the one that loves me. And I will love him and my father will love him and we will reveal ourselves to him. So God looks at how serious we are about knowing what his word says. It's hard for us to convince ourselves and convince God that we love him when we're ignoring his word. And today, in the world we live in today, we are plagued by a scriptural ignorance of God's people that really don't know what the Word of God says. I'm, a, I'm amazed. Uh, last night I explained you know, what the Greer Christian Learning Center is and the, and the teaching of the Bible to these students. And a lot of them are students that grew up in the church. And now they're in high school. And they come to us and they don't know the basic stories of the Bible. How can that be? That's an indictment against them, but it's an indictment against our homes and our churches too. Um, the great need of the hour is for us to know, thus saith the Lord, what the Bible says. And if we don't know what the Bible says, we can't obey it. There's no way to obey something that you don't know. And therefore, we live our lives day by day, we live as practical atheists. Meaning we live our life contrary to what God's word says. If we don't know what his word says. If we don't know what the word of God says, then we're going to lack faith. Because what did Paul write in Romans chapter 10? Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And if we don't know the word of God, we're going to, have a, we're going to struggle in our faith. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews eleven six 6, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. I mean, you think about that. If what we're doing does not require faith, then it's not pleasing God. Doesn't matter how much we think we're accomplishing for God, if it doesn't require faith, it's not pleasing God. Because, again, God will not be receiving the glory for it. If we can figure it out, I ask people the question many times, will, will God ever ask you to do something that you can't do? And a lot of people say, well, no, never. He would never ask you to do something you can't do. The Bible is full of examples of God asking his people to do things they can't do. Only by faith, allowing him to do it through us. And see, the world needs to see that. And we, if we don't know God's word, if we're not deep in his word, then our faith will be weak at best and the world will not see what God can do. If our faith is weak, we won't tell others about God. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And others need to hear it. And so we owe, John Calvin, the great reformer, said we owe the, to scripture the same reverence that we owe to God. And if I struggle in 
and been reverent in my desire to know God's word, then I'm going to struggle in my reverence towards God's book, the Bible. So God does measure our love for him based on how much we desire to know his word. A few years ago, I was at my home and um, looking for something. My wife will tell you I spend a lot of my time looking for stuff. Um, I think I'm kind of like James wrote that the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Because I'm usually while I'm doing something, my mind's somewhere else and I end up losing something there and I can't find it. And it's become comical almost how many times I have to stop in the course of a day and say, Now, Lord, you know, you know me. And if you don't tell me where that is, I'll never find it. And, and he just pretty much does. I mean, it's, it's, to me, it's a miracle. He'll, in the moment in time, he'll say, go over there and look in that. And I'll go look. I lost my ring one time. I found it in the pantry with a candy. Um, anyhow, I was looking for something. Um, I was looking for something. And, and it wasn't that I'd lost it. It was just something that I needed. And I knew it was there. And my wife is very organized. And I'm not. And, and I knew where she might have put it and stored it. So I was going through there looking for it and I came across a stack of envelopes about that thick that was bound together by a ribbon. And I looked at that, it was in this drawer and I pulled it out and my curiosity awakened and my wonder quickly drew, grew and so I slid the ribbon off and I picked up the first envelope, I had no idea what it was, opened it up and pulled it out. And what it was, was a letter. All of them were letters that I had written to my then girlfriend, she's my wife now, when I was a student at Clemson. Now I graduated in Clemson in 1973 and back then, you know, we didn't have telephones in the room. There was no such thing as a cell phone. I stayed in the old, if y'all familiar with Clemson's campus, it's the old tin cans for, for four years. And, um, I, I, and they're gone now. I really, yep. I, I hate that. But, uh, you know, they were made out of metal. They were, they were actually built for the, uh, the GIs coming home from World War II so they could go to school on the GI Bill. Well, the walls were noisy and loud, no air conditioning, hot, no phones in the room. So I wanted to communicate with my girlfriend. I would write her letters. I went home every weekend. It wasn't like I wasn't going to see her for five days, but... I couldn't wait that long. And she would write me letters. And um, she kept those letters. Now, when I came across those letters in that drawer, many, many years later, after we'd been married for a number of years, how do you think that made me feel? It, it strengthened, I already knew this, I knew that she loved me. But it, boy, it sure, it sure didn't make me feel good. And it made my commitment to her even deeper and stronger. Well, how do you think it makes God feel when he sees his children desiring to know what he wrote? To cherish it that much to say, I will hide it in my heart. I'll bind it in my heart. Well, that's how God looks at us when we love his word. That's why he measures our love for him by how seriously we are about his word. The Bible was inspired and written by the Holy Spirit. It's not a book about God. It is God's book. It is God's letter to us, his word to us. In the Bible, we find the truth of everything. I mentioned last night the great need we have in our world today is the world doesn't believe that there is such a thing as an absolute truth. Well, guess what? Truth is a person. It's not a concept. It's not a set of facts. Jesus said in John 14, 6, he said, I am truth. If you know him, you know the truth. Jesus said of the Holy Spirit in John 14 and John 16, he said, he is the spirit of truth. 
And because we're God's children and we have living within us, we're the temple of God where the Holy Spirit abides, we always have access to the truth. There's never a time, ever a time, when a child of God should not know the right thing to do. Because we have the Spirit of truth living in us. And Jesus said about the Scripture in John 17, he's in the high priestly prayer, he said, Thy word is truth. This Bible is the only book you will ever read. That when you read it, the one who wrote it is with you every time. You can't say that about any other book. Every time you open the Bible to read it, the one who wrote it is there to help you understand it. For someone to say, I don't read the Bible because I just don't understand it. What you're saying is more about what God can't do than about what you can't do. It has been faithfully preserved throughout all the ages the Bible has. You know, we read about the scribes in the Bible and Jesus came down hard on the scribes sometimes. But you know what the scribes did? They were the ones that trans transposed the Bible. They would make the copies and write it. And they knew it so intimately that if someone brought them a, a scroll and said this is a copy of the scripture, they knew that they, the scripture that they had, they knew they could turn to the center point of whatever book it was that they had. Say it was Isaiah. They could pull, turn to the, open it up, they could go to the, they knew the number of words that would be in it, and they knew what the center word was and the center letter of the, what, that it was. And they would count over, and if it wasn't that letter and that word, it was the middle part of that thing, they would say, this is a fake. This is not a true truth transcript. That's what we owe to them because the Bible has been has been preserved for us and we know that the Bible is under attack today. But you know what? It always has been. But the prophet Isaiah said that the Bible and the word of God when it goes forth will not return unto God void. It will always accomplish its purpose. Always. And so therefore it is important that we as God's children know what the Bible says. And that's why scripture is critical for people, God's people to be revived and be the influence in the world that we are called to be. The Bible, Jesus said with the salt of the earth which means that we make people thirsty for God. We need to be salty. People tell me you can lead a horse to water but you can't make him drink and I say baloney. I got two horses. If I want them to drink, I know exactly how to make them drink. I get a little piece of salt and stick it in their mouth and close their mouth. And when I turn them loose, they go straight to the water trough. And you know what? If we do that, if we're salty in the world, people will be thirsty for what we got. Light of the world, he said, let our light shine. He said, we're the fragrance of God, Paul wrote. Would be that. But in order to do that, we have, have to be under the influence of the Word of God. So tonight, what I want to do is look at some of the things that the influences that the Bible has, should have upon and why it's important for us to be in the Word all the time. Last night, I mentioned 2 Kings chapter 22 and King Josiah young king who became king at the age of eight and and in chapter 22 it talks about something that happened when he was um, about 26 years old and they were rebuilding the temple or, or renovating the temple and so he commanded the high priest the chief chief religious person of the day to to over kind of oversee that and I want to read verse, beginning in verse 8. It says, In Hilkiah, the high priest said to uh, Shaphan, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. So Shaphan, the scribe, went to the king, bringing the king word, saying, Your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it to the hand of those who do, to do the work, who oversee the house of the Lord. 
And then Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Now that's an interesting thing there. The high priest and the scribe had lost the, the law. For all these years, you know, the, the, the psalmist said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. 119th Psalm. Here the word of God had been hidden from even the high priest. They found it. Kind of like me shuffling through that drawer looking for something. They accidentally came across the word of God. And he brought it to Josiah and verse 11 says, Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. He trembled, he repented because he had never heard it. Now that wasn't his fault necessarily as a child. Somebody didn't read it to him. Somebody didn't put it before him. Somebody didn't do, didn't do their job. The, Bible, the, the word of God didn't mean enough to somebody to even read it to a child. And he trembled. And that began the great revival under Josiah. Um, Verse 13 says, Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. What do you reckon Josiah read? Or what they read in his presence that might have stirred his heart so much? Let me read something to you. 17th chapter of Deuteronomy. Remember Moses was, re was reading the law before he died to the, children, to the people of Israel. <clears throat> Speaking of the king. Also it shall be, verse 18, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book. From the one before the priest and the Levites. And it shall be with him. And he shall read it all the days of his life. That he may learn to fear the Lord his God. And be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. That his heart may not be lifted, up, uh, uh, lifted above his brethren. That he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left. That he may prolong his days in his kingdom. He and his children in the midst of Israel. Maybe that's what made Josiah tremble because he had never heard it. And one of the things it said there is the king was to write his own, I don't want to say translation, but he was to write down the law for himself. You know, a few years ago I started a practice of something, the journaling. I'm too soon old and too late smart. And um, I wish I'd learned that earlier. And one of the things that really helped me was to read scripture and then sit down with my journal and write, what did God just say to me? And how does it apply to me? And all of a sudden it makes it very personal. And I think that's what that Moses was talking about there in Deuteronomy. Well, it inspired the heart of Josiah and it, and it stoked revival in his heart and in the heart of the people of Judah. And that's what God's word is intended to do. It's a two-edged sword, and it cuts going in and coming out. So tonight I want to look at just a few things for us to think about, about what God's Word should do to us when we read it. One of the first things that the Bible does when we read it is it reveals the holiness of God. We live in a day and time in which the name of God is not reverenced. And if we don't live our life the way the Bible prescribes that we're to do it, then we're not being reverent. And we're not glorifying God before a lost world. The great example of this, of course, one of the great examples in the Bible is found in Isaiah chapter 6. You know that passage. Isaiah, I believe Isaiah was actually transported up into the throne of heaven. He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. And the Bible, Isaiah talks about the seraphim. 
that were there. And you know, I don't think that, that term seraphim is used anywhere else in the Bible. The special angelic beings that were given that one task to stand and glorify God the whole, all the time. They were different from the other angels because they had two extra sets of wings. And you probably heard sermons about why that might be. But it does say that with two of them, they covered their face. You remember when Moses was on the Mount Sinai out to receive the law when he came back before the people. That they, they told him, cover your face. We can't bear to look upon you. Because even the reflection of the holiness of God was so bright it blinded them. And so these seraphim are there day and night. And they are saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. You know, in our day and time, we have ways of, of emphasizing things. We underscore it, we underline it, we highlight it, we can put brackets around it. In the Bible, when something was to be emphasized, many times it was repeated. For example, in the life of Jesus, when Jesus was teaching, many times he would say, Verily, verily, I say unto you, or Amin, Amin. Meaning, pay attention and listen. Well, here in the sixth chapter of Isaiah, we see the glory of God and the holiness of God exalted to the third degree. Holy, holy, holy is God. God guards his holiness. And as we read the scripture and, and we read about the nature and the character of God, our Reverence for the holiness of God should be heightened and enlightened. That's why it's important for us to be in the word so that we never forget who God is and how holy he is. Because the Bible tells us, be ye holy for I am holy. What is God's standard for us? Why it's holy. He expects that out of us. We're his children. And when we begin to depart from that, then we have a problem. Two examples in the Old Testament. The sons of Aaron were given the, the task of bringing fire into the altar of the tabernacle. And it was consecrated fire. Blessed. And one day they decided to take a shortcut and they brought in, the Bible calls it strange fire, into the tabernacle for the altar. And God struck him dead, just like that, because he's holy. We didn't read the account of when the Ark of the Covenant was being brought back to, to Jerusalem after it had been captured. And, and you remember the account where they, they set the Ark on, a, on, on a, a new ox cart. Now, the Bible prescribes how the Ark was to be, to be carried on poles, and there were certain men who were to carry it. For whatever reason, they decided it was okay to put it on an ox cart that day. Started out, the ox stumbled, and one of the men who was walking alongside reached up to steady the ark, just touched it, which sounds like a reasonable and noble thing to do. God struck him dead because the ark was holy. No man was to touch it. And that, that man probably thought, well, he don't want that ark hitting that old dirty ground, landing on the dirt. Well, the dirt was just being dirt. It was doing what God created it to do. When it didn't rain, it got dusty. And when it rained, it became mud. That's what God created it to do. But that man's hands were defiled. He touched the Ark of the Covenant and God struck him dead. Because he profaned the holiness of God. It makes me tremble. It makes me tremble to, to think about how I have done that in my life. The Bible reminds us of how holy God is. The Bible also reminds us and reveals our sin to us. Paul said that the law is a schoolmaster. It's to show us how far short we fall of God's glory. I tell people sometimes if I had a whiteboard up here and I and I told you to come up and draw a straight line freehanded. And you drew a straight line. And you'd say that's a straight line until I put a yardstick against it. A straight edge. And that straight edge reveals how crooked your line is. Well, that's what the law does. And when we read God's word and we understand who God is and what he requires of us, 
the Holy Spirit uses the word of God to convict us of our sin. That's what Jesus spoke about in John, in John chapter 16. And when the Bible calls it sin, guess what? It's sin. We can try to rename it and excuse it and call it whatever we want to. But when the Bible says it's sin, it's sin. That's why repentance is so important. Repentance is such a positive thing. We look at repentance as being something that makes us tremble. But God puts a requirement of repentance upon us so that we can be brought back from our failure into a right relationship with him. Which leads me to the second point. The word of God cleanses us and sets us free. Ephesians chapter 5 says that we are cleansed by the washing of the water by the word. That's how we get our spiritual bath every day. That's how we can be cleansed so that we can stand in the presence of God with prayer and our prayers so that we can be clean, cleansed to do that. Jesus said in John 8 that you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. And again, that's why repentance is such an important thing because it, it lifts the guilt away from us and sets us free from the, from the horror of sin. And you know the funny thing about repentance? When the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and we come to that point of, of understanding and realizing that we need to repent and we repent to the Lord. What does First John say? If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when that happens, you know what? There ain't nothing Satan can do about it. All he can do is stand there and roll his eyes because he can't do anything about it. All of his efforts to try to separate us from God and God's love are, are all gone away when we stand in and repent. And, and that's only going to happen. When we're made aware of our sin by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit uses the word of God to confront us with. That's why it's important for us to be in the word. As I read the word, no matter what part of scripture I'm reading. The Holy Spirit can take that scripture and he can do anything with it in my life that he wants to. If I open my heart up to it. Another thing that scripture does for us that leads us to revivals is it causes us to hunger and to thirst after righteousness. You know what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? He said, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. When we read the word of God and the Holy Spirit takes the word of God and, 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 and begins to massage that into our heart. It creates a deeper desire for us to know him. You remember Paul over there in Philippians chapter 3. He said my supreme desire is to know him. And the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of the suffering. And so that's what happens when we. Allow the Holy Spirit to cause us to hunger and thirst after righteousness. The way it shows up in our life. And the way we can judge ourselves, engage ourselves. Is by the fruit of the Spirit. Now the fruit of the Spirit we read about in Galatians chapter 5. That's, that, that's put there for, our, for our, our, our reading. And I encourage you daily or often. Go to that list and, and take an inventory. You see, it's not you that produces that. It's the Holy Spirit that produces it. And just like Jesus said in John 15, I'm the vine, you're the branch. If any man abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But without me, you can do nothing. Well, the word of God in the hand of the Holy Spirit will produce in us the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, gentleness, all those fruits. And I found in my life that when I begin to notice that one of those fruits is missing, Joy. All of a sudden I find out I don't have joy. Well, that's a problem. 
Because it's the Holy Spirit that produces joy. So something's happened between me and the vine. If I don't have joy, or goodness, or gentleness, or, kind, or patience, or those things, they're all fruit of the Spirit. And if that fruit's missing in my life, or if it's not as sweet as it used to be, something is wrong. And I need to go back to my Lord, and back to His Word, and let Him refine that in me again. And deal with whatever it is that's robbing that in my life. The Bible also reminds us of God's promises and his future hope. The Bible says we're to, not to despair. Paul says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. That's a promise. So when I read the scripture, no matter what is going on in the world around me, and I, if you like me, I find myself shouting at the TV sometime when the news is on. I don't need to do that. Because the Bible reminds me of that God's still on the throne and my hope is in Him and the promises are mine to claim and nothing can change that. And it keeps me at peace with myself, keeps me at peace with my fellow man when I focus upon the word of God the Bible is also the key to God's revelation we talked about that last night and the people of God we live by revelation we don't live by any other means God opens our eyes to the truths about who he is and God's word does that it reveals him to us. And if we don't have that as Proverbs 29, 18 talks about it, says we, when, when, when there is no revelation, then the people go about doing things in their own way according to their own plans. And there's a whole long list of things we could talk about tonight. But one of the main things, too, the Bible is for us and why it's so important in our life as Christians. And if we're going to live in a, in a daily revival with the Lord, it's important that we have the word of God because it is our weapon against Satan. Ephesians chapter 6. In that great list of the, the armor of God. God expects us to be in the battle. We're going to talk about that tomorrow night. And that's going to be the, the sermon tomorrow night. And he's given us what we need to defend ourselves against the ways of the world and the ways of Satan. But the, the weapon he gives us to defeat Satan with and evil with is the word. The sword of the word. It defeats Satan every time. Eve had the word of God, didn't she? But she didn't use it. She didn't believe it. He says it's impossible for us to live one way and believe another. What we, how we live our life tells how, what we really do believe about God. And if we believe the truth of the Bible, then we will stand on the truth and face down Satan. With the word, Jesus had the word and he defeated Satan with it. And so the word of God is our weapon. But how can we use a weapon that we have not hidden in our heart? How can we, you know, some of y'all probably were in the military. What was one of the worst things you could do? I, I know I wasn't in the military. I was in the ROTC at Clemson. And I remember, boy, our drill sergeant would get really irate at us when he came out on the drill grounds and would walk up and inspect us. And he'd take that weapon out of our hands. He'd look down the barrel of it. He'd check that thing over. And brother, if it wasn't in A1 tip top, top notch shape, you got demerits. Because the worst thing you could do is have your weapon not prepared for battle. Well, folks, if we're not immersed in the Word of God, and if we don't spend time in that word every day and hiding it in our heart and 
in preparing the weapon for the battle that we will face every day against Satan. Every day that you live as a Christian, you're going to have a battle with Satan. And if your weapon is not ready for battle, you're going to have a struggle. But when that weapon is there, and one of the, one of the things that the Holy Spirit does, and I love this, and you know, in that, again, I encourage you to often read John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. One of the things the Holy Spirit does, besides convict us of our sin and guide us into all truth, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit causes us to remember everything that God has said. But how can you remember something that hadn't already loaded into your mind? If you hadn't already hidden it in your heart so that the Holy Spirit has access to pull that out. He said we have a part to do in that. That's how we keep our weapon against Satan ready for the battle. That's why the Bible is so important. So tonight I want to leave you with that thought. What shape is your weapon in? When we neglect God's word, we are moving away from the only source of truth that there is in the universe. Jesus Christ. When we neglect God's word, we are pursuing the ways of the father of lies. Because see, there's a battle going on always in our minds. And then what Paul talked about, that, that battle in our minds. And Satan's interjecting thoughts and, in, and the way you defeat him is with the word of God. If we neglect the word, we're, we're not prepared for that battle. When we neglect God's word, we are calling God a liar. We don't believe it enough to even know what it says. You know, if I, if I know right now that there's, there's something that's critical for me to know in order to operate a piece of machinery safely, I'm going to read up on that. <laughs> I'm going to make sure I know what it says. Because I don't want to make a mistake of that thing going south on me. Well, you know what? God's given us everything we need to live according to the way he asked us to live in the Sermon on the Mount. But we need to read it. We need to understand it. And when we do not, or when we neglect God's word, we are telling God that we do not love him above all things. That's what Jesus said in John 14, 21. The one who has my word and obeys it, is the one that truly loves me. And when I don't spend time in the word, I'm telling God, I really just don't love you enough for that. I told you last night, one of the ways I can tell when I'm drifting away from the Lord in my relationship is that my desire for the word diminishes. It's a symptom. So when I come to the end of the day and I realize I haven't spent enough time in the Word, there's something that's distracting me. So the challenge today for God's people is to return to God's Word. We live in a time when God's people, as I said in the beginning, there's a lot of spiritual ignorance about God's Word among God's people. And if there's ever a time when we need to know, thus saith the Lord, you know, you go back and read the Old Testament prophets and they didn't come with their opinion. They didn't come with a, a suggestion. They came and said, thus saith the Lord. You can choose to obey it or disobey it. And if you obey it, you're on the path to revival. If you disobey it, you're on the path to judgment. But thus saith the Lord. It's important for us to know The Bible. I want to close with this story. I, I saw this movie one time, and I don't even know the name of the movie. Don't know who starred in the movie. Don't even know the plot of the movie. I don't even know how it ended. But I know how it started. And it took place during World War I. 
And the opening scene was this soldier had returned home from the war. And you know, World War I was, and World War II were different from the battles that we have today because one of the things is the communication. Man could go off to war in World War I, and you might not hear anything from him in months. I had an uncle who had a son that was born that was two years old before he ever saw him. And uh, this story happened that this man was re returning home from the war in World War I. I opened up in the scene, he was in New York, and he was standing outside the door of his apartment. He knocked on the door, and his wife opened the door. And she's standing there dressed up in party attire, ready to go out on the town. He was shocked and disappointed. And she was shocked. And, and he said, well, what are you doing? She said, well, I, I didn't know you were coming home. And he said, well, I wrote you a letter. I wrote you a lot of letters. And I wrote you, in my last letter, I told you I would be home on this day. And I was expecting you to be at the shipyard when I got off the ship, but you weren't there. And now I come home and you're going out on the town. She said, oh, your letters. She said, I, you know, I read the first one that you wrote to me and it upset me so much. I just didn't read the other letters. All the letters were laying over there unopened. Well, needless to say, the marriage didn't last. And again, I don't know how the movie ended. But I remember that scene. And I wonder what it's going to be like when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ. You know, we'll all stand there one day as God's children. Our sins, our souls already been judged the moment when we were born again. But, but when we stand before Christ to give an account of our life. The Bible says he's going to judge us based on our faithfulness. Not necessarily on our results. As much as our faithfulness. Did you do what I asked you to do? And what is he going to say to us when he looks at our life and realizes we didn't even bother to read his letter? All the things that could have been accomplished. All the things that could have happened in our life and through our life. That we just kind of <coughs> neglected because we just didn't love him enough to read his letter. There's nothing in the life of a Christian that will take the place of meeting God on the pages of his word. So tonight I'm going to leave you with that challenge and just going to ask you, how is it in your life? Do you give the reverence, the same reverence to the word of God that you do to God himself? That's what the Bible is. So now I want you to think about that. Tomorrow night we're going we're gonna to talk about the practical side of this. Of revival. What it should look like. And what God expects out of his children who are obedient to his word. And live in the right relationship with him. I want to pray and then... David, I'll turn the service over to you. Father, we thank you for the blessing that you give us of your word. Lord, sometimes it causes me to tremble when I think what it would be like if we didn't have your word. What if we lived in a land that wouldn't allow us to read your word? Lord, forgive us for neglecting it, and I pray, Lord, that in that the, the, in the heart of the Christians in America today, throughout our land, Lord, we know that what we need in America is not going to happen through those who don't know you as Savior. But they can't come into a relationship with you, Lord, unless they hear. And they're not going to hear from us unless we're inspired by your word to tell. So, Lord, build in us a, a, a desire to know you and to make you known and to know your word. And we pray all this, Lord, in your holy and righteous name, in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. I hope you all were as blessed as I was tonight.
And let us take the Lord's word serious. And I hope you can join us tomorrow as we close our revival. And truthfully, revival isn't just a, a three-night session. Revival is a, a change in life. It is adjusting to God's will. Let us close with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for blessing us tonight with your word. And I thank you for blessing us just having your word. That we personally have our own copy in our own hands. That we don't have to worry about it being hidden or forbidden in our own country. Thank you for the freedoms that we have. I thank you that for the men and women that have died, that we could have your word in our hands. And I pray that you would help us to be faithful to know your word. For your word is for our good. It is for reproof. It is for correction. It is for instruction in righteousness. That we may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Help us to take serious what your word has to say to us today and help us take serious what you have called us to do in being faithful to make disciples of all nations. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.